Okay, cool. Guys, I want to welcome you to another episode of the Advisory Board Podcast. And I have with me a, a, a good friend of mine, Heather McLeod. You may or may not have heard of her before. Sometimes she's referred to as the queen of franchise marketing, never by herself, <laughs> by way, only by her close friends that like to torment her because we know she hates that. So, uh, but Heather, uh, welcome to the the podcast. I'm super glad to have you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. So I want to tell you guys a little bit about Heather. Those of you who don't know her, she's uh, she's the chief growth officer over at Authority Brands. Um, if you've been under a rock, they're a large platform company that has 16 brands, 2,100 franchise units. So they're they're kind of a big deal, but good folks. Uh, they've got great strategy. Heather uh, just got promoted to be the chief growth officer there, but she was CMO there for what, like seven years or something like that? Yeah, so for a good amount of time, about five years. Yeah, Authority Brands is only five years old. Isn't that crazy? But I've been with the broader organization with the cleaning authority to start for about eight years. So it's that's been right. Fast. I, always, I always forget about that transition when they, they yeah, yeah. consolidated. Yeah. But um, uh, so anyway, so Heather, today, uh, actually, before I go on, Heather, uh, a, couple, a couple of things that I would love from you. Would you share a little bit more, maybe about your background in franchising sure. and also just authority brands in general? You're probably the best person to share that versus me. <laughs> sure. So, um, so I've been in franchising for about 13 years now, um, all of that time in home services. So I started at Neighborly and then moved over to the Cleaning Authority back in 2015 and then was here through kind of the launch and build of Authority Brands as a platform um, through all of the acquisitions that now bring us to 16 brands operating in 15 home service verticals. Um, so it has been a very fun fast path. It's hard hard to imagine that five years ago, there weren't uh, 16 brands, right? So, I mean, I'm sure in five more years, there'll be more than there are now. Um, so it's been a blast. Um, really, our focus is in a couple of key areas. I said home services. So it's in recurring revenue businesses. So things like house cleaning, um, pest, you know, mosquito control, um, pool cleaning. Um, and then it's also in kind of break, fix, things that people can't do for themselves. So plumbing, HVAC, electric, those mm -hmm. are kind of the big buckets that our businesses fall into. Yeah, and you, and you guys have got a lot of great tools in place. Uh, and we're, we're gonna talk about today, guys, the reason I wanted Heather on here is not only does she have a great purview across tons of different brands and challenges and industries, but but uh, there we we still we're still heading into a, a market that's not bullish, right? Like we've got a lot of headwinds still, and in the home service space in particular, lead volumes have been down twenty to twenty five percent, depending upon the, the the sector, and that has a bit of a compounding effect. And it's and it's probably not over. Not Doctor Doom here, but there there there's a lot that we need to be paying attention to as a home service franchise entity or or just home services in general, any brand, even the personal service brands are down and the, the elderly care has, has been pretty sta stable, but people are trying to figure out how to do it more on their own because they can't suck as much cash out of their house right now with interest rates being so high. So it's affecting every industry. Uh, but what we want to talk about a little bit today is you know, how do you change strategies? Like how do you pivot? What are creative ways that don't cost you more money necessarily that you can make sure you're, you're, you're adjusting to the marketplace uh, with your marketing strategy? Uh, so Heather, a couple of things that you and I talked about as we got this started were, uh, and let's, let's start with the first idea, which is you're getting leads. They're just a lower volume of leads right now. Uh, how do you, how do you maximize the ROI on the lead spend you're currently getting, even though volumes are down? Let, let's start with that. What are a couple of your thoughts about way pe ways people can address that? Yeah. So I think it's, it's always a good opportunity when lead volume drops to take a look at what your funnel looks like, right? So in different businesses, sometimes there's a couple different conversion points, right? So in some of ours, you know, you we get a call, we go out to a house, we might give an estimate, we might quote a job, they might close it on the spot, they might not. So there's a couple different touch points, right? So I think looking at what that process is and looking at what your current conversion rate by stage is and trying to identify how you tighten that up, right? So the, the best place to start is really from the bottom up from a revenue perspective. So yeah. if any of your businesses involve any kind of selling, whether that's in a home or over the phone, looking at what those close rates are, um, whether that's by person on the team um, or by service line, whatever that looks like, and try to identify where there's some meat that maybe you're leaving on the bone. 
um, and taking a hard look at that along with your operations team to say, hey, okay, if we're closing seven out of every 10, how do we make that eight out of every 10 or nine out of every 10? Because those are leads you're already paying for. Mm -hmm. And that's revenue. That's just a missed opportunity. I love that you brought that up. I, I literally coach people on this all the time. Uh, you've got to look at the holes in the bucket at every stage because, right. and, and it's, it's different by franchise operator. That's the, the hard thing about franchising is yeah, you've got an operations manual, you've got the playbooks, you've got the marketing locked in, but as soon as the lead leaves the marketing channel and becomes a lead, that's where the variability comes in. And you'll see some locations are phenomenal at booking that first appointment and they suck at closing. And some are the opposite. Yep. We're like, your schedule rate's like 35%. That is awful. Compared, well, I mean, some industries that'd be really good, but like I, I have clients that average like 70% booking rates. Right. I've, right. Got a, I've got one guy that has a 91% booking rate with all digital leads, um, ridiculously high. But but you've got to be able to figure out like, okay, if that if you book it like, let's say 60%, but then your close rate is 30%. Overall, you only got an 18% close rate pretty much on, on your leads. You got to figure out where the holes are in between. And, and how do I coach that franchisee up from, from yeah. the, the 20% book rate to be you know get up to his peers at like the 60% book rate? And I think it's important to, you know, sitting in the franchisor seat, I think it's really important to understand what that KPI should be mm -hmm. for the network as a whole. So let's pretend it's 70. So then I would go back to the guy who's at 91 and say, your pricing is probably too low. Uh -huh. You should probably raise your prices, right? Because if you're booking at 91%, you're probably leaving something on the table. So it's, it's, it's a little bit of a numbers game, right? To say like, okay, would you rather have more, right? That you have to staff for to go and do at a lower price? Do you rather have a little bit less at a higher price? And in every business model, it's a little bit different, but it, you know, sitting in the franchise or seat, when you understand kind of what those metrics look like, mm -hmm. then the outliers, right? Because you're always going to have people who outperform and you're always going to have people who underperform. But when you have someone who's a high outlier in either direction, it's a good indicator that, hey, there may be, maybe something isn't quite as optimized as it could be because their performance is really really crazy off the charts like mm -hmm. that's that's great it's easy to it's easy to book someone to replace an hvac system if you can come right away and it's really cheap but normally that's not the case right so yeah. so it's just good to look to look at some of that stuff right and, and have a good handle on what it should be for the system and then i think also you know as a franchisor what can you do to help your franchisees by automating some things around missed opportunities so if something doesn't book or something doesn't close, do you have a process and is it executed using some kind of automation or mm -hmm. is the process that every individual franchisee is supposed to follow up with people who they didn't close, yeah. right? Like that's very ambiguous and there's a lot that you could do kind of from a top-down perspective to help, to help your franchisees kind of try to recapture missed opportunities, whether that's missed sales in home or it's missed bookings at the franchisee level, if they're answering their own calls or even at the call center level, if they're using a call center, what's the process on, on leads that you've identified as potentially high value that were a missed opportunity. They should have an immediate response kind of hunted team, right? To try and reel in that revenue. So, so yeah. just think about that too, because a lot of times if it's left to the franchisee, they're not necessarily focused on what's falling out of the funnel as much as they are the next new call that's coming in. Right. I'm so glad you brought that up and, and it made me laugh. Sorry that you were, you were describing it that way. <laughs> those, of you, those of you who are listening and not watching this video, you missed the air quotes when she said franchisees follow up. And, and it's and it's not funny because franchisees are awful at follow up, but they're inconsistent. Like I, I see that all day long. It's why yeah. the whole company exists. Right. So, um, but the, the reason why I, I want to chime in is because you're describing a really smart process here. Look at every stage to, to figure out where there, where there are gaps. Benchmarks, so you know what the average should be. And then also, this is where I think people are missing out on this. I don't hear anyone talking about this very often, but the real value or the, the, the value prop of franchising is it's the is not just the, 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 the genius of the franchisor who put the system together. It's actually harnessing the collective genius of the hundred different operators that are doing Absolutely. things differently. So when you see one that's got 
an 80, an outlier on the good way, you need to talk to Betty, find out how she's getting her schedule rate to be 20 points higher than average. And then you need to have Betty do the training in the next power up call with all the franchisees, right? If you find somebody who's struggling, then you might say, Hey, Bob, Betty's crushing it. Why don't you guys get together and you know shadow her for a half a day, learn about her systems, then try to implement those down in Memphis because she's in Tallahassee. It's not that far away. She it's not a huge different market. You can you can do the same things. So that, yeah. those, those are things I feel like franchisors often miss the boat on, and they can create huge value for the organization. A hundred percent. I mean, I I've said it for years that so many of my ideas are really just things that franchisees have done that I just stole, right? Technically I didn't steal them. We worked together on it, right? But <laughs> franchisees will tell you, they will write the path of what your job should be and what you should be doing, right? And sometimes they're not the best at diagnosing the solution themselves. And this happens a lot in marketing, right? Because you hear franchisees say like, we should be running commercials or we should be doing this or we should be doing this right but if you take the time to really talk to the network and understand well why do you think that mm -hmm. oh, you think that because your brand isn't as recognizable in your market as you want it to be okay well let's solve that problem right so that sometimes i think franchisees get you know this reputation for wanting to do wild and crazy stuff when a lot of the times they're trying to solution something and the root cause of what they're getting at is exactly right right we need to solve for how do we get you more awareness in market? Mm -hmm. It's just sometimes the solution they bring to the table isn't the one that aligns with what the marketing team thinks or what the operation team wants to do. And because of that, they sometimes don't always get heard as, as loudly as they should. So I think yeah. you're dead on. I mean, that's the benefit of the system, right? Is that you've got a lot of people who are figuring it out in the weeds. Of course, some of them are gonna crack the code a little bit better, faster, quicker than some of the others. and that's our job, right? Is to shine a spotlight on those people. Say you're doing awesome stuff. We want to actually turn this into the new best practice for the network. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree with you on that one. And uh, well, well, we that's another podcast topic for another day. How to do that effectively, right? <laughs> Down so, the rabbit uh, hole, yeah. Yeah, no, but it's a good rabbit hole, and people need to think about this more and more because as things tighten up and, and continue to tighten up, I, I doubt that we're going to pull out of this one like in the next thirty days, right? Because we're, no. we're going to start slipping into like slower service season at the end of the summer as people go back to school. There's a little bit of a dip and then it slows down until Christmas and then it's dead in January, right? So this is a great time to be thinking about since lead volumes have been down, you don't have as many people to chase. You don't have as long of a backlog of services you typically have. Well, what are some some other ways as, as these guys are looking at you know their lead handling process or call centers? Like what, what are a couple of key tips you, you would recommend people pay attention to in those specific areas? Because lead handling is a big part of the bucket. That's the biggest part of the funnel is trying to get people yeah. to an estimate or to a, a scheduled onsite appointment. Um, any other tips in that area? Yeah, I mean, answer the phone. That's like I, I, the amount of times we spend talking about people who don't answer the phone. I work, like It's just insane to me that this is still a topic in, in home services, right? Um, yeah. Answer the phone, answer the phone. And um, I would suggest in your messaging. So when, you know, phone rings, people hear, you know, your IVR, your automated messaging, I would um, encourage you to also have alternate ways that they can contact you in the messaging. So for example, we're going through the process of rolling out right now that our call center messaging before an agent answers the phone, right? Thank you for calling. Did you know you can book online, press one, and we'll text you a link to book directly yourself over mm -hmm. the phone. That's cool. Right. So think through like the phone needs to be answered at a local level. If the franchisee is doing it, do you know if they're answering the phone or not? Everyone thinks they answer the phone and then you test it and sometimes they don't. And then at your call center, right, they should be able to get to almost all of your calls in your statement of work and your performance based agreements. Right. So that shouldn't be as big of an issue. But every now and then things are going to spike right? And they're probably staffed down a little bit versus what they are in a normal season because demand is so low. So you're still going to have peaks and valleys of demand hitting your call center. So mm -hmm. making sure that you have a really clear overflow plan, because the goal should be to try and miss as little as possible to get as much top of funnel. So those are some of the metrics that I would look at. How long are people on the phone before an agent answers? How many calls 
hang up before an agent answers and getting those to be as small as humanly possible um, would be the ideal. Yeah, I, that's great feedback. Now, there are a lot of folks that don't have call centers. So I want to add something to something you said before. Answer the phone. Also, mm -hmm. pick up the dang phone and make a call. Uh, because people, I hear people justify all day long. Oh, well, nobody wants me to call them. No, dummy. They just reached out to you and gave you all of their personal information because they want you to call them. They want, obviously, they've got a hot house, you know, an HVAC. HVAC is timeliness. That's like the number one predictor of who's going to get that deal is who shows up. 100%. And, and so... But if, you know, in a lot of under, other industries are still similar. Like if you wanted someone to come and power wash your house, you're not just going to like sit around and wait for three days. Whoever gets to you first, you're like, sweet, come out and you'll know, bring your gear. Like, oh, 200 bucks, fine. Like just get it done, please. And and a lot of the, and, and a lot of folks, they don't, they feel like, well, I don't want to bother people. I don't want to call them. I, I'm putting on my, my lame voice. Sorry. I don't want to call people because I think it's <laughs> intrusive. Like, up and get to work. You you own a business. They just told you they want you to call them. Just call them and text them and email them. And then the customer will choose which in which channel they want to interact with you within. But you got to do all of them. And uh, I find that people don't want to pick up the phone. They don't, they don't want to call twice. They're like, well, I already called them once an hour ago. Do you want the job or not? Because he might be in a meeting or his kid might have just fallen down the stairs. Like, are you going to let your competition just walk in there and take it without you trying again? Like, Leaving a voicemail is great, but you got to call again. It's got to be usually multiple touches yeah. before they convert. Well, and I think that's a good point too, right? So it's like, we kind of talked about it a little bit earlier, but like at every stage of your funnel, whatever it looks like for your business, you should have a rescue plan for the people who fall out, right? Yeah. So like, mm -hmm. it should be, it should be, you know, I hate to say like put pen to paper, but like put pen to paper, write it down. It should be a thing. It should be a process. It should be just as much as part of a system and process as how you actually handle a sales call or how you book in that process. Right. So it's like, you should have, you should be trying to maximize all of that. Right. And then the piece too, is once you have someone in your database, once someone's a customer, what are you doing to try and keep them and to upsell them? and to maximize the revenue you're getting off of that customer because there is no additional marketing costs. Mm -hmm. There's probably yeah. some maybe direct labor costs if you've got someone who's making outbound calls for you, but it's way cheaper mm -hmm. to generate more revenue off of an existing customer than it is to get a brand new one from scratch. Yeah, and, and a big part of that, I just wanna sh to say, Hallelujah. Yes. Like that's exactly what you should be doing. And also the reason why, like the reason why is because they already trust you. You've already got a relationship. Right. It took you three weeks and four visits and a quote and a phone call to establish that trust. And then you did a job and you did a good job. So now they don't, they don't have that experience or that trust with anybody else. So of course, if there's something else they need, you can provide, they're going to say yes to you. But a lot of franchises, I, it's crazy, Heather, you've seen this too, but how many, how many franchise systems are not leveraging one of their most valuable resources, which is their their previous right. customers. Hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, a hundred percent. So existing customers is a huge part of the equation. And I think there's creative ways, like some brands I think might think like, oh, there's, you know, it's a one time service. They don't need it that frequently. Think about creative ways to leverage that in some capacity, right? Like when times are great and business is booming we do things a little bit different than when times are a little tighter. And so if we're talking about, you know, plumbing, right. As a business line, like mm -hmm. we don't normally market that will come and do a plumbing checkup. Like we're normally just answering the phone and, and working jobs, but when mm -hmm. things are a little tighter market to your existing customers, you'll do a checkup of some kind, an indoor air quality checkup, uh, you know, panel check, whatever it is, right. Work yeah. with operations, figure out what you can offer to get people in homes because once you get people in the house you're probably going to find some work that needs to be done that you can do and provide to help elevate you know their quality of life in their home right i'm not saying like create some fake problem to solve for them but oh, be no. creative about how to get people thinking uh oh this is great this is free i can have them come out they can take a look for me and you know you can go from there so it's it's about getting your your guys who are trained to sell and close more opportunities at bat. 
Because sometimes yeah. you have to be creative about what that looks like. And it's not the way you operate when you have more jobs than you can run, right? Because that same guy needs to be at the most valuable, oldest homes with the oldest systems upselling and getting after it. But when you don't have enough work for him to run, you got to find something, right? So be creative about how you think about it. And that's the perfect type of messaging for existing customers. Yeah. And, and guys, the, one of the challenges you have if, if you're not doing stuff like this is you're probably seeing a downturn in service, which at some point leads you to say, well, I need to, I need to reduce, uh, do a riff, like reduce my workforce, which means when things bounce back, you'll be stuck where a lot of people were post-COVID that had laid a lot of people off. Like, oh, crap. Right. Uh, now I need to find people. And people who were your best employees that you had to lay off, they don't want to come back to work for you. Uh, they've, they've gone somewhere else. So you want to keep your people busy. You also want to make sure you're generating revenue. And you also want to keep that relationship alive with your clients. Because while they're there, let's say there's nothing. They're like, wow, the repair work we did was fantastic. I don't see any other needs. Thanks for letting us come and check this. It's really nice for us to look at our service. And um, who do you know? Uh, you know, The homes around here are about the same age. Who do you know has been having some issues? Uh, you know, People that I might be able to go and since I'm here, uh, anybody you think I should stop by and say hi to? And harvest referrals, but like not, like not pushy referral, like who can you refer me to? But like, ask them that question. Like, who are some of your neighbors who might have similar challenges to you? And, and you'd be surprised how many people say, oh yeah, Bob was just saying his front hose spigot was leaking all over the place. Cool. Well, where's Bob? You want to walk over with me real quick? I've got an extra 15 minutes. And like, you know, if, if, if your service schedule is not packed, you need to train your people how to get referrals while they're on site. Yeah. And you know, the interesting thing about COVID for a lot of people is it made them actually closer with all of their neighbors, right? People's bubbles got a lot smaller. And so, you know, maybe you didn't always know the people two houses down, or maybe you didn't necessarily know who was, you know, across the street, but for a year, right, we were all staring at the same people making small talk about who knows what, because we needed things to talk about. So right. in a lot of places, you know, people are People are maybe a little closer with each other than they were pre-COVID. So, you know, people know what's going on in their neighborhood. I think it's a great idea to to always just ask, what do you know about anybody else who might need some help? How can I help anybody else in the neighborhood? You know? Yeah, I'm with you 100%. We, we had talked before, I, I want to stay on this topic for just a second, about, about reviews, like the power of getting oh, yeah. reviews and building reputation. How do you feel, see that that like factors into this, you know, lower volume of lead flow? Like how can that help you close more deals by, by focusing on that as a post-sale, post-customer engagement service delivery milestone? How have you seen that impact that? Yeah, well, I think to start, right, I think about reviews, especially online reviews, right? It's, it's basically where they all are these mm -hmm. days as a uh lift mechanism or a detractor to your effectiveness of marketing spend, right? So if you're spending all this money on marketing, even if it's offline, right? Even if it's direct mail or anything like that, it's just human nature. People are going to go online. They're either going to go look up your phone number. They're going to go double check what services you offer. They're going to go make sure you work in their area. But when they do that search, right? People aren't necessarily typing in your website URL. I mean, when's the last time you directly typed in www.com? Most people don't do it, right? They just go to the search bar, they type it in Google, it pops up the result, they click, they click the brand, even from a brand perspective, right? So if you don't have a high volume of reviews and if you don't have a high star rating, you're gonna kill your marketing efforts. You're not, that person's never even gonna call you, right? They're just gonna poof, disappear and go searching for someone who does what you do, but is rated better, right? Mm -hmm. So creating kind of a feedback loop, right? Where you're getting reviews from your customers and everyone in the business understands the importance of it. Hands down the most successful review campaign we ever did um, before things were as automated as they are. And now it's kind of like a built-in process piece on every job, but back before we had that kind of tech, the best thing we ever did was run an employee appreciation month campaign where we told all of our customers that it's employee appreciation month and we're paying our employees more, the more that you tell them that you love them basically. And we told all of our customers, we didn't pay our customers to leave us reviews, but we paid yeah. the staff 
to wow. get the reviews, right? So service level went up because everybody knew that, hey, okay, Mrs. Jones knows like to leave me a review. So I better be tip of the spear, right? And so what ended up happening was employees made more money. They were happier. Service level went up. Happy employees stay, yeah. right? Happy employees create happy customers because they're getting consistent service from people who are trained and know what they're doing. You're not training new people kind of on the customer's you know, dime and experience. Um, and it was a really great, it was a really great, really easy little promo. We did it twice a year for several years, just as a big push to say, you know, hey, we want to reward our employees. Tell us how great they are. And the best part about that is they had to leave the person's name in the review. And it is so much more authentic to hear, you know, Dave is so great to work with. What a great experience I've had with Dave. This is amazing versus client Heather is great. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's True. like when you're talking True. about people by name and it like comes to life and it feels so much more than just, you know, the cleaning authority is great. I love the cleaning authority. No, mm -hmm. I love Heather because she always takes care of my kid's room and she sets up their little stuffed animals and it's so cute and they love to come home and see that. And she's amazing, right? It, it brings the brand to life a little bit. So I could go, I, I've gone down a rabbit hole on reviews, but, but I think it's a really important thing yeah. when we're talking about like how to make the most of what you've got when times are tough from a lead volume perspective. They're tough for everybody, right? So the people who are going to win getting the phone to ring, they're going to have, they're going to have good reviews. Yeah. And I want to share a thought. In fact, this was from a mutual friend of ours. Uh, well, it's from Mark and Bryn. Uh, I was talking to that the first podcast I ever did was with Mark, but we were talking about this years ago. And he said, you know, you don't, you may not know this, but you you mentioned early on, like the synergy between the, your reputation online with Google and also your SEO and even your PPC uh, impact. But he, if you don't have at least a 4.0 review and somebody types best, whatever your service industry is, you won't even show up on the results. Like Google will re restrict you from the results because you don't have a high enough reputation to be considered the best. Also, the higher your, rep, your online re reputation Google factors that into their, their SEO, their local SEO and say, oh, well, the, you know, this is a, you know, this keyword is attached to this person and this keyword is found in the reviews and, and, and like their, their Google My Business information, push more, push more deals to them or more, more traffic to them because they're a better match. So it, it's, it's more, it's also, yeah. it's, it's wonderful. It, it gives you good visibility. It's also a social proof. Almost every, it's like 97% of people go check online reviews before they buy a service especially a home service that's expensive, you better believe they're going to check. And if they see you've got a 3.7 review and there are 20 people with a 4.3 or higher, they're not going to buy from you. It doesn't matter how much your, your, their, your, their friends said that you were great. Um, they're going to probably buy from somebody else. I would. And so, uh, yeah. And so, so. Yeah, maybe. no, absolutely. I mean, lead volume hides a lot of problems, mm -hmm. right? When leads are through the roof, you can get away with a lot of stuff, right? Because people can't get their demand filled by, you know, the person with the five star rating. So, you know, they call around who has availability, who can get here quick. And, you know, it, it hides a lot, you know, and then when, when demand slows down a little bit, the reality, you know, that you're looking at is the people who are going to win and capture a you know disproportionate share of that volume and maybe not be down by 20% in leads, maybe be down by 5% in leads are the people who have a really strong reputation. They're, they're just going to win because there's not as much to go around. And in all those capacity-based businesses, right? They're trying to fill trucks too. Everybody is. Right. Yeah, you're darn right. And, and even some of the channels, like if you look at some of the platforms like Thumbtack, the the they actually their platform is designed to reinforce reputation of right. the supplier and so you're not gonna you're not gonna be even showing up on some of their lists you'll be 20 people down on the list so the homeowner might not even get to you by the time they've made a decision of who they want to reach out to for their service call so and even some of the platforms reinforce that behavior too yeah absolutely absolutely i mean google's own right lsas you can't even you can't even buy that ad unit without a certain volume and star rating right so they've yeah. made it really clear i mean i think at the end of the day right google is the best example of it 
they want to deliver the best option to someone as upfront as possible. They don't want you to search twice. They want you to search once, Mm -hmm. right? So they're going to try and show who they think is the absolute best and how they determine that, right? A good amount of it is, you know, social proof. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Well, let, let's shift. Let's talk a little bit more about creating scale now, because uh, one of the things that we're not going to be able to do is staff as much as we could, uh, you know, with, with volumes being down. We've got to get a little more creative about how we create scale without without getting more humans involved in the process. That's mm-hmm. that's a key strategy right now. So what are some of the ways that you've seen technology help solve this issue where you can still still provide high levels of quality service and, 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 and contact rates with customers or whatever the case may be? How have you seen tech play into this ecosystem where we need to be a little more frugal, but we have to put more effort into it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a, you know, another good thing to do when things get tight, right? If you're trying to get more leads in the funnel, I think the gut people go to is marketing. What channels are we using? Where are we putting our money? The other thing to think about is, is it easy for people to interact with your business and what mechanisms do you have to get them in the funnel? Yeah. So we talked a lot about phone calls, right? Like that's the, that's the most, you know, most common denominator is pick up the phone and call, but what are you doing with your website? Right? Like what kind of tech enablement do you have so that people can book or schedule in other ways? And it might be a good opportunity to turn on more channels more mechanisms, if you will, whether that's chat, whether that's online booking, ideally things that all integrate with your CRM, because we're not trying to create an email that goes to some inbox that then someone's got to call back, right? Like tech is an enablement. So it's a good time to think through like what, how do people want to interact with you? Do they want to text you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What kind of process and, and path user journey do you have for that? So that's another, you know, the tech can really help in that area um, because it isn't necessarily tech as a replacement for a person. It's tech as, as in making the pie bigger, opening up a new pond of people who maybe aren't the type of people who want to get on the phone. I don't know about you. I'm not a fan of calling. If I can book something myself, if I can text to get on a calendar, if I can do literally anything other than getting on the phone, right? Except for things like this. I mean, like to schedule things. Like yeah. I hate having to call the dentist. Mm-hmm. Why can't I, why can't, and all, the, all the appointments are probably the same time slot. I know I got to go every six months. Why do I have to get on the phone? And then we have to, I have this time, I don't. I have this time, I don't, right? It's yeah. really inconvenient, so yeah so yeah so i I would say tech as a way to have channels maybe that you're not using right now doesn't Mm -hmm. necessarily require more marketing spend just requires you know some thought around business processes i agree i mean technology should be um, an amplifier for humans it shouldn't ever be thought of as a replacement for humans and what I mean by that, like, think about the, the let's not use the dentist, because that's irrelevant to most people. Listening. <laughs> but like, for example, you're a tree, a tree service franchise, um, sure. or you're a roofing franchise. Now, people will call when they have questions. They're like, I'm not, usually the calls come like, I'm not ready to book, but I need to know, like, can you guys, I've got a, a steep slope metal roof. Can you, can you work on that? And, and you know, and a lot of people, they can't find that answer on your website, so they got to call. But what, so going back to your point, making sure your website's more robust, like keep track of what people call about people. Like you should have some way to document that. And then if you get 37 calls a month about steep sloped metal roofs, then add a dang land, a page about that. So people can find the answer to their question on your website, because as much as you want to have them call you, and there are some people that would scream that this is a bad idea, but you actually want to make it so customers can find their answers on their own without having to call you. Uh, right. Because it's just wasting human capital. If you're trying to trick people and you know with with ambiguous language, so they will call to get in. Yeah, they, some people are like, no, I want them on the folks that can close them. Then you suck as a human because you're not you're not being yeah. people. You know, it's, well, it's, and it's, that's like such a that it just reminds me of like that was the franchise development mentality for so long. Like, put nothing yeah. on your website, put nothing because yeah. force them to fill out a form, force them to get on the phone. The reality is. 
that's kind of an all or nothing. Either every single person in the industry has to operate like that, or some competitor is going to do what you're not willing to do uh -huh. because of fear or whatever reason, right? So yeah. you're, you know, the tree guy at town over or the roof guy at town over is going to put every single detail he possibly can on his website. And when they can't find it on yours, they're not going to pick up the phone and call. They're already sitting in front of a computer or they're scrolling on their phone searching. They're just going to search again, mm -hmm. more specifically, more directly and try to find someone who can do it because it's, you know, and you got to think about time of day too. Like who wants to get on the phone with somebody at seven o'clock at night? Can you, can they even do that in your business? Mm -hmm. Are you even staffing your phones at night when someone is sitting on the couch thinking about all the stuff they should have done, but they were too busy working all day. Mm -hmm. So they didn't do it. You know, it's, it's a great point. I, I think the point even just broader than that, it never fails that every time I sit and listen to calls and I still do, I spent half of a day last week listening to phone calls from various brands, various franchisees. I always learned so much about our business when I listen to the phone ring and play calls. You mm -hmm. hear things that you never even would have thought about. So that would be, that would be my piece of advice, um, is block some time every couple months and play phone calls. Listen to what customers are saying across your brand. Um, because it will expose things and give you ideas. Maybe we should add content to the website. People are asking for a service that we don't provide and they're asking for it a lot. Mm -hmm. Why do we have something out there that's misleading? Or maybe we should get into that service line. You know, it, it's really interesting. So if, you know, people aren't doing that, it's cumbersome, right? You sit and listen to a lot of calls and sometimes it's scary because you hear things you're like, oh my gosh, we're doing that. Whew. Yeah, but wow. you learn a lot really quickly. Yeah. Well, and, and most people that I talk to about something like this, because we, I, I encourage people to go and listen to staff calls, team calls, but most of them say this, they say, I don't have time. I don't have time. Well, I'll just tell you guys this. If Heather McLeod has time to listen to <laughs> here and there, then everybody has time to listen to some phone calls. And I, I'll do Valuable. this sometimes on my team. And and it's like, oh, that's a coaching moment. Oh, like the call center, call man, the call center manager should be listening for those sorts of things. But what you're listening for are what are the trends? What are the keywords? What are the issues? Mm -hmm. that because now you're close, you're truly closing the loop on your marketing because you're saying, Oh, we got a whole bunch of these people asking for uh for you know a, a tree planting service. Where did they get that idea? Our market. Exactly. Oh. And then you start to see the trend and say, there's a page where we use the word tree planting and Google must be queuing in on that. And it's drawing SEO traffic. Let's change the wording there because that has nothing to do with us. But how on earth would you know that that was going on unless you were hearing the customers? Because, uh, you know, your, your, your call center folks aren't taking copious notes and sharing those details because they don't have the vision that you do of your marketing strategy and your keyword strategy and your PPC strategy. Like it, it's, uh, I think that's really smart. Really smart advice. Um, any other thoughts for yeah, Heather? I know we've 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 gone. Yeah, I know we we're a little bit over time together. But what would you share as kind of as, as parting advice for folks that are that are thinking about you know tight, things are tightening up? How do I how do I improve my my marketing ROI right now so that I can continue to weather the storm and be stronger when we get out on the other side? Yeah, I think when times are tough, it's always a really challenging time for marketers. Because a lot of times the marketing team, right, is the one that starts to take the hits right away of why is lead volume down? Why aren't you doing more? Why are our costs going up, right? And I think the recognition that these are some macro trends in the economy, I think is really important. So I think first and foremost, just working and continuing to strengthen the relationships between marketing and operations. Mm -hmm. I will say in my career, it's been the most valuable relationships I've had are the ones I have with my peers and operations, because once we're all on the same page about what's going on, then we can solve problems together. And they bring all kinds of great ideas and thoughts to the table on the business process side of some of those funnel things we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's a, it's a great time to lean in with operations a little bit, remind everybody that we're on the same team and, and start tackling some of these things together. Um, and then I would say as much as you can push to not reduce marketing spend. Um, okay. I know it's really easy when things start to, you know, get tough to say, 
well, we need to manage to a percent of spend budget. So if revenue drops and marketing can't go above a certain percent as a percent of revenue, you know, now is the time to, to, to try and push to be able to maintain some of the spends, especially in the channels that are direct lead generating. It mm -hmm. might be more expensive, right? But you need every lead you can get in a tough market and trimming channels or trimming budget is only going to further reduce what you're seeing. So as much as you can push to keep budgets. So those have been the things that I've been trying to keep my team focused on along with all the tactical, practical kind of things, but those bigger picture things, because at the end of the day, you're still managing a team that's working through a tough environment. And the only thing that makes it even tougher is losing your team. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. <clears throat> If they start feeling discouraged, overly pressured, uh, unappreciated, yeah, they feel like someone to blame. Yeah, they're going to go find something else. There are still there aren't as many right now, but there's still plenty of opportunities out there. So don't don't undervalue the team. I've got yeah. one for you. I've got a friend from high school. Her daughter is a national. She's a freshman, or she's going to be a sophomore this season. And she she made it to nationals last year as a cross country runner. My family oh, all cool. I, I played sports because I had. Uh, other sports because I had too much ADHD. I can't just run. It drives me crazy. <laughs> but when you are in a race, when you are in a race, uh, where do you pass people? <clears throat> it's not on the flats. It's not on the downhill. You pass people on the hills uh, because that's when everybody, they, their pace tends to slow a little bit. If you can maintain your pace as you go up the hill, you'll pass people. If you can accelerate your pace when you go up the hill, you'll pass, you'll pass more people, maybe burn yourself out. So you've got to maintain your pace up the hill so you can pass people. This is where you eat market share. Uh, I, I had a client and I don't do this often, but you know, I used to be in the language industry before I came here five years ago. And I still have people that refer their friends and colleagues to me to get advice and coaching on how to, how to grow their business in the translation industry. And this guy came to me right before the pandemic. I started working with him and it's a pandemic kit. He got shut down and, and he's like, well, what do I do? And I said, well, you don't stop. You don't stop these behaviors. You don't stop. And this is why you eat market share. This is the time where everybody starts to get a little bit rattled and they make bad mm -hmm. decisions. Your competitors, even yeah. franchisors in your industry, they're making bad decisions right now about cutting spend, reducing this, trying to make things work a little better with less, uh, less money going into the marketing effort. And what that means is there are more opportunities for you to start eating that market share up. And then when, when, the, when the tides rise, you'll find that you're rising up above everybody else. So eat as 100%. much market share as you can right now that's my, my parting advice to you yeah i couldn't agree more and that's exactly what we saw happen through covid right it was tough it was brutal it was not fun i wouldn't want to go back to it lots of long nights thinking about how we were going to recover some of our businesses and sure enough a couple months later you know that's when the cleaning authority went from the number two residential cleaning company in the country to the number one was on the tails of covid so you're exactly right it's tough, but pull out that list that's in the drawer of like everything I wish I would do on a rainy day. Uh -huh. And it's the time to start rapidly attacking it all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with you. Heather, you have been fantastic. I'll have to have you on another time so we can go down those other rabbit holes together. <laughs> sure, appreciate all of your insights and advice. Thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much.